So hello and welcome to the lecture on the last component of this course gender and literature. So as you know by now the last component will actually be focusing we are already focusing on advertisements and representations of gender uh, differences in gender problematizations in gender in popular media. So we looked at certain advertisements already um, in the last couple of classes and we will carry on with that study today in this lecture. So, um, as you know by now, as we have been discussing in the last couple of lectures, and advertisements are a very um, interesting representation, a very interesting reflection uh, of the kind of consumerist culture we inhabit and internalize uh, in the world we live. Uh, and obviously, like many things, uh, many inanimate things, consumerism or consumption or the politics of consumption too is deeply gendered, uh, as you know by now. Uh, and I am sure so you are thinking of more examples uh, after seeing the last couple of lectures. Uh, we are probably going back to TV and watching uh, the television, uh, the advertisements in television and so thinking about how you know there is a very deeply gendered politics uh, in the kind of representations in television advertisements. So the, the point, uh, the important thing for us to remember in this segment of this course is advertisements obviously they want to sell you something, right. So the sellability is a very important factor in advertisements. So the way a particular product is branded. A way of the way in which a particular uh, product is presented or represented uh, is something that you know really is a decisive factor in advertisements, right? So we had already talked about commodification. So commodification is a process to which uh, a human being or a living being or an entity it doesn't have to be a human being all the time. An entity becomes a commodity. In other words, an entity becomes something with a price, something which can be purchased, something which can be sold and consumed. Uh, in different kinds of economic systems. So, commodification is a very key uh, term, a very crucial term uh, in, in advertisements as you, you know, obviously would agree. Uh, because if you do not, if you cannot commodify something, you cannot advertise something and if you cannot advertise something, then obviously the politics of consumption will become problematized. So, if you are producing something, uh, so advertisement becomes a promotion of that kind of a production and obviously it is triggered, it is designed uh, with a very performative uh, perspective with a very performative component, uh, you know, in order to evoke in you certain emotions, certain effect, uh, which you sort of push you towards being a, being a consumer of that particular product. So um, the thing that you know I hope to have uh, established by now in the last couple of lectures that all the critical terms we've been talking about uh, in this course, performativity, identity, uh, commodification, agency. Uh, etc. Uh, these play very crucial roles in the in the culture in the world of advertisements, especially because advertisements do rely quite heavily on all these aspects and perhaps even more. But for the purpose of our course, we sort of narrow it down a little bit uh, in terms of looking at the gender politics of advertisement. To, to what extent uh, are products gendered? Uh, to what extent are products regendered, uh, degendered, and regendered? And you know, uh, because gender, as we have, uh, and I hope to have established by now because gender is a, is a text, is a construct. Uh, anything which is a construct or a text can be uh, deconstructed and reconstructed uh, with different kinds of rituals. So, there is a very strong coded quality about gender as we know by now. There is a very strong uh, ritualistic quality about gender as we know by now. So, gender entails an apparatus, a ritual through which a certain identity is established, articulated, protected, circulated, etc. I mean, if you can think of all the texts we have studied in this particular course from Shatan Shukilari to Shooting the Elephant, Joseph Connor's Heart of Darkness, right down to uh, Look Back in Anger, and also Catherine Mansell's Fly. In each of the texts, we find there is a certain degree of gender construction, uh, and you know, in, in some of the texts, there is an attempt to uh, preserve that construction. I mean, almost all the texts. Uh, they also rely a little bit on the politics of preservation. So, how do you preserve a certain kind of gender construct? Uh, what happens if that particular gender construct begins to give way to another construct coming in as the classic case in point would be obviously uh, Shatan Shkikilari, where a certain kind of gender identity, a certain kind of gender system begins to give way uh, to another kind of gender system because of the uh, political and economic changes in that particular space. So, obviously all these things are related, uh, political situations, racial situations, uh, economic situations, all these things are related in terms of looking at gender as a performative playful construct, which can be deconstructed and reconstructed uh, through various processes, material processes as well as abstract processes. Okay? So, these, these factors are very important when we look at advertisements and gender, because you know, all these things come into play very heavily in advertisements, in the culture, in the world of advertisements. 
so in the last couple of lectures in this segment, we, we looked at, uh, for instance, if you remember uh, the uh, advertisement with um, uh, the first one which we played, which was an advertisement for a beer company, uh, which obviously uh, made a very blunt binary between uh, you know, two kinds of commodities, feminine commodities and masculine commodities. So, the assumption was very blunt, very binaristic, but also the important thing was which we discussed uh, in that uh, particular segment and I will repeat a little bit just so you can get a clarity in terms of what we are about to do now. Uh, every advertisement, every uh, advertisement film, um, it is sort of, uh, very conscious of its consumer. If you are not conscious of your consumer, if you are not conscious of the location of your consumer, then obviously as an advertisement, as a commodity, you are not going to sell. So, in a particular consumerist culture, which is uh, western, white, wealthy, um, such an advertisement would work, um, the Heineken beer advertising which we saw yesterday, that would work. But that would not work uh, in another uh, kind of a democratic system, another kind of cultural system where the courts are different. Likewise, the fair and handsome advertisement which you saw yesterday starring Shah Rukh Khan, the Indian actor, uh, you know, that too would just work, only work in a certain kind of a cultural uh, social system with a certain kind of cultural and social moral values. Right? It would not work uh, in a westernized world, in a, in a, it would not work in a white western world where people really do not have to become fair. Right? So, all these uh, little things really add up, all these little things have really become important. Uh, in advertisements, because at the end of the day, advertisements they appeal to the contemporary society. They are, they are produced out of the contemporary society. They appeal to the contemporary society. So you cannot look at advertisement as something which is divorced uh, from what's really happening around it. Okay. So each of the ads which we, which we'll see, and of course we'll also play a, uh, a little section from a film. Uh, all these need to be really located and contextualized uh, and put uh, in in a perspective in a context of the the broader cultural condition of the time. So, you know, it is absolutely imperative that we look at these advertisements in some details. So, so for instance, just to go back uh, on the fair and handsome advertisement. So, as I mentioned when uh, I was discussing this uh, yesterday or in the last class that, uh, you know, till the 1990s, till the mid 1990s, we had a proliferation in the market about fair and lovely creams. And the entire idea, the entire objective was to make fairness a commodity uh, to be consumed by a woman because you know, fairness, beauty, uh, femininity, these were all very easily equated with each other. It was unthinkable uh, till the late, late 90s or mid 90s uh, you know, or the early 2000s uh, actually that men would require uh, any fairness cream of any sort because it would be unmanly to put on uh, powder to look fair. It would be unmanly, it would be unmanly, it would be considered unmanly uh, to put on any kind of uh, make up uh, in a public space, people would be, people be laughed at if people did it. right? So, it would be a bit of a dressing down, manning down kind of a thing. It will not be an act of manning up, it will be an act of almost emasculation. right? But what happened in the early 2000s was obviously the economy became more liberal, it was sort of it opened up uh, to many products. So, the entire era of liberalization happened in the early 2000s. As a result of which, uh, the companies began to spread the wings, the companies began to uh, sort of expand the clientele. So, no longer would it, would, was it sufficient to sell fairness cream only to women. So, there was a, a temptation or an attempt subsequently uh, to make fairness a commodity in men as well. right? But obviously, if that would entail breaking away from a certain value system. So, you can understand how things like economy, morality, ideology, commodity, they are all linked to each other uh, in very sort of not just discursive, but also in very superficial ways. Because what I am saying to you uh, is sort of is a very superficial equation which is true. So, the superficiality of the connection is something that uh, is also interesting. It does not have to be embedded, it does not have to be deep and embedded and profound. It is right there on the surface. Okay? So, economy, the change in economy, the change in commodity politics, the change in consumerist politics, the change in ideology, the change in uh, the market, the change in uh, you know everything, the political situation, etc. So all these things become important and connected to each other at some deep discursive as well as uh, superficial levels. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the entire idea of fairness became masculinized. So it was important to masculinize fairness. In order to do so, 
it was important to break away from the erstwhile idea of fairness, which was limited only uh, to a feminine understanding of fairness. So, in that particular advertising which we played yesterday, if you remember, would start in you know, the actor, uh, he, would, he was reprimanding the wrestler for using the female fairness queen, which was uh, an act of, uh, you know, uh, he was mocked at, he was laughed at for using a female fairness queen. And obviously, if you remember the advertisement, uh, there is a lampooning of his masculinity, where he is portrayed wearing a frock in a wrestling arena, he is portrayed using lipstick and, uh, and nail polish. It is almost like a penalty uh, and a parody and a penalty for using the female queen. And obviously, the, the panacea for that, the solution for that is to use the male fairness cream. Right? So, fairness which used to be female is now being rebranded as male and obviously it's, the entire thing has been done through an economy process, through a market process, through a discursive process. The narrative changes. Uh, the narrative behind fairness as a commodity changes. The narrative which in, informs the commodification of fairness changes. Okay, so, it becomes fair and handsome rather than fair and lovely. So, again the adjectives change as I mentioned yesterday uh, and the entire commodity changes uh, and it becomes okay for men to use fairness creams, but obviously uh, with the caveat that it should be used, they should just consume not the female fairness cream, but the new male fairness cream. So, obviously, but no one knows uh, what is the essential and chemical difference between the two. We are not interested to know, but you know, we are just interested to understand the rebranding and that is enough for us to consume it unquestionably. Okay? So, again the, the point is the politics of consumption, the act of consumption itself becomes very gendered. The fact that I am walking into a store and buying a certain product that too becomes a gendered form of embodiment. Right? So, again uh, an embodiment as you know is a very crucial term, uh, something which we have been talking about since the very inception of this course. So, embodiment uh, is something which is dependent uh, not just on the neural behavior, on the linguistic mechanism of you, on your consciousness, but also on your immediate environment which includes economy, which includes the society, which includes the discursive structure etcetera. Right? So, embodiment is a two way loop, it is a two way process, it is in, from internal to the external and vice versa. Okay. So, in, in a, the entire embodiment of <coughs> around fairness changes, it becomes masculinized etcetera. Now, with that in mind, uh, so this is one example of uh, a particular commodity which uh, essentially rebrands itself. So, you know a cream, a fairness cream which used to be very very feminine uh, and very very uh, female uh, is now being rebranded as a male product and is now consumed as a male product. Uh, you know obviously, uh, with, with an eye to expanding its uh, clientele, ex expanding its consumers base. Right? So, it is good for the economy, it is good for the market and it is also good for the model system which is uh, sort of been consolidated through the difference between you know the fairness screen for men and the fairness screen for women. Okay? So, that is something which we saw yesterday. Now, the advertisement which we will see today uh, uh, and this is one of the texts the, from which you will get uh, examination questions. You find again we take a commodity which is uh, you know which used to be considered very stereotypically uh, you know stereotypically female which is chocolate right. So, chocolate when I use the word chocolate to you uh, you know the obvious assumption is that it is a female commodity it is a female product uh, which is something which is loved by women only and it is sort of uh, quote unquote unmanly to love chocolates. Uh, you know that used to be uh, the, the dominant moral tone uh, you know apropos of this particular commodity. So, again look at the way in which how a moral tone is constructed and circulated and consumed around certain commodities. So, chocolate which is a commodity which is obviously made out of different elements which have got nothing to do with a woman or men, but the assumption is the taste of chocolate the sweetness or the uh, little burning smell of cocoa uh, everything put inside you know it appeals to females more than to men. So, that was the assumption that was the very sexist understanding of that com particular commodity uh, and you know and that that was the assumption which was consumed in social circles, which was consumed in economic circles, it was consumed um, in normal everyday circles um, the circles which we inhabit uh, on a daily basis. Now, the particular ad which I will show you in a moment, uh, it, it sort of inverts the entire logic. It, it, it uses chocolate, it takes up chocolate, uh, a chocolate biscuit uh, and makes it manly. Right? So, and not just that, it makes it extremely manly, it makes it uh, sort of ultra manly. Uh, so, it goes the other end of the spectrum as it were, uh, because you know what it does at uh, this particular uh, company, this particular commodity is it sort of A, it departs from the usual 
the stereotypical sexist notion that chocolates and femininity are equated and equable with each other. Uh, they go together very well, they're completely compatible with each other. Uh, but also, uh, it, it breaks that, but also it, it establishes a new equation, it establishes a new kind of uh, inner correspondence that this is a chocolate, this is this masculine chunk of chocolate which can only be consumed uh, by men and not just consume, it takes a step further. You have to earn this chocolate, right? You have to earn this chocolate by passing a masculine test, right? Now, this is a bit bizarre as you know because, you know, normally you would associate chocolate with women, normally you associate chocolate with, you know, femininity, the female form of consumption, whatever that means. I mean, there is no such thing obviously empirically speaking, but that is the stereotypical understanding of a certain kind of consumption that, you know, women love shoes, women love chocolates, teddy bears, etc. and men love machine guns uh, and, you know, alcoholic beverages and, you know, good looking motorbikes, etc. So, that is a very stereotypical uh, dualistic understanding of, you know, forms of commodification in terms of gender. However, this particular advertisement because it seems to have an anxiety that, you know, it needs to overdo it, uh, it needs to really break away, it needs to hammer home the point that this is not really a female chocolate. Uh, because, you know, uh, it is aware of the fact per perhaps that, you know, it is dealing with a commodity which is, uh, you know, ostensibly female, right. So, now it needs to rebrand and re-articulate itself and re-inscribe itself as a very, very uh, alpha male commodity. And this alpha maleness is important over here, right. It is not just male, it is not just masculine, it has to be absolutely alpha male. So, I will play the video in a, in, in a minute, but I will just tell you the story a little bit. Uh, so, this is uh, you know, this is a grocery store where they have this chocolate. Uh, the name of the chocolate is Yorkie, uh, and the advertisement. So the film shows that a girl dresses up as a boy, but not just as a boy, as any boy. He, she dresses up as a minor boy. So someone is wearing a minor's helmet, and obviously that entails that you know establishes a certain kind of embodiment, a certain kind of masculine embodiment. It's not. It's not just simply uh, saying that she is you know becoming or you know performing the role of a man. It is even more complicated than that. It is sort of saying and suggesting that she is performing the role of a very manly man, someone who works in a mine, someone who is a miner. So, working class, manly, very physical masculinity. Uh, she wears his helmet, uh, puts on a fake moustache, walks into a store and asks for a Yorkie. Right? Now, the, the shopkeeper in, this, in that particular grocery store becomes a little suspicious uh, of the fact that because she thinks, he thinks that uh, maybe perhaps this is, a, this is a girl and he asks her in a very vulgar term, you are not a bird are you? Bird obviously suggests him that you know it is a very vulgar term for a woman, especially a young woman. It is a very uh, vulgar masculine term, a masculine metaphor uh, for a woman. So, you know he asks her, you are not a bird are you? And then, uh, you know, he subjects her to a series of tests, which includes a, uh, you know, knowledge of football, a B, uh, you know, knowledge of vulgar expressions, uh, C, fearlessness, uh, and fourthly, uh, physical, uh, physical strength. And then she passes all those tests. She is perfectly able to answer the offside rule in football. Uh, she is not. She is absolutely unperturbed when he springs a plastic spider on her. Uh, you know, she manages to open a very tight. Uh, lid of a particular jar uh, and she manages to respond very spontaneously uh, quote unquote spontaneously uh, to a very vulgar metaphor uh, for a woman right. So, she passes all the tests which is to suggest that she is sort of she knows the codes of manliness right. So, the, the shopkeeper very reluctantly gives her the, the, the bar of chocolate Yorkie uh, and then just as about she is she is about to open the uh, chocolate and about to consume it. Uh, he he gets closer to her, he puts his, he takes his face closer to hers and sort of whispers uh, to her ear saying, you know, that blue wrapper, that wrapper of the chocolate brings out the beautiful blue of your eyes. Uh, to which she says in a very uh, quote unquote coyish female tone uh, really, uh, which sort of obviously reveals that she is a woman immediately and the chocolate is snatched back from her. So, you know, this is a very regressive, a very blunt, a very, uh, you know, uh, obviously sexist uh, advertisement, which you know, which, which is full of presuppositions, which is full of uh, all kinds of automatic assumptions. Um, the, the assumption is uh, men know all about, all men know about football, all men are very strong, uh, all men uh, are unafraid of spiders, all men use very vulgar expressions when talking about women and a converse is true as well that no woman loves football, no woman is unafraid of the spider, no woman uh, would participate in a vulgar uh, you know language game uh, and no woman has physical strength. 
And the final uh, presupposition is equally problematic. Uh, it suggests that you know, the assumption is that all women are you know, susceptible or vulnerable to flattery. Right? So all women, no matter how hard you try to break away from being a woman, you are always susceptible to flattery. You are always susceptible, you are always vulnerable to flattery at a physical level. So, you know, you just, which is to say that you know, you, you're saying uh, you know, you, you're susceptible, you can't say no to flattery, you, you give in to flattery. Especially if someone uh, you know, describes you as a beautiful person, uh, describes the beautiful blue of your eyes. Now, the reverse is also true. Uh, the, the presupposition, uh, if you reverse that, that would say, that would suggest that no men uh, are actually susceptible or vulnerable to flattery. So, men are absolutely uh, indifferent to flattery, which is what this particular advertisement uh, you know, tries to suggest. Right? So, and so, it's full of these presuppositions, it's full of these assumptions at very deep, hardcore levels. Uh, at very superficial as well as embedded levels, which makes this advertising very, very problematic at different levels. Okay? So, now I am about to play this particular video. It is um, like I said, it is about this you know, chocolate biscuit called Yorkie and I have told you the story. Uh, it is about uh, trying to pass off as a man in order to earn your Yorkie. In other words, uh, it is not a commodity which can be purchased, it is a commodity which, can, which should be earned and it can only be earned uh, through a series of tests, through a series of uh, sort of exams in which you have to pass. If you can't pass it, if you can't pass those tests, then obviously you don't deserve, you don't get your yorkie at all. So this is the long and short of the advertisement, which I'll play now. So this is on your screen now, the yorkie advertisement. Yorkie, please, mate. You're not a bird, are you? No. Explain the offside rule then. A player cannot be in an advanced position of the opponent's last defender when the ball is played. Open that. Stockings are tight. Stockings. Oh look, a big hairy spider. You know that wrapper really brings out the beautiful blue of your eyes. Really? Yorkie. The <laughs> party big masculine chunks of chocolate. It's not for girls. Right. So as you just saw, I mean this is a deeply sexist, problematic, offensive advertisement. But the strange thing is it it makes a chocolate manly and that's something very bizarre right because you don't expect that if it was a, a Kawasaki motorcycle if it was a Pulsar motorbike if it was some kind of beer you'd have understood okay this is a very sexist but stereotypical and expected kind of branding kind of a commodification but this is problematic because it's looking at a chocolate which you know is a reverse kind of a thing because a chocolate uh, we normally equate with femininity uh, softness you know love romance sentiment is not really quote unquote manly uh, in common parlance but this particular advertisement it sort of breaks a stereotype but of course it, it doesn't break it and becomes radical it doesn't do that at all it breaks it and creates a reverse stereotype Right, so you know it, you always essentialize in this particular advertisement. So you find uh, when you play the ad that it's the woman, the, the girl walks into this uh, store, uh, you know, dressed up as a minor. And, and if you notice sartorically, uh, you know, the sartorial uh, embodiment in this particular advertisement, and I'll play it again in a minute. But just to sort of give you an idea, as I said, so she's not just becoming a man; she's becoming the the perfect manly man, right? Uh, so that which is suggested by you know, the fact that she's wearing this minus helmet. Uh, and putting on a fake moustache and speaking with a very manly accent, working class manly accent, a Yorkie mate, which obviously is something which will be told by a working class man, not a genteel man. So, a genteel man would not be manly enough, but this is obviously uh, someone who is absolutely manly in every sense of the term. Now, uh, what is Im interesting obviously is uh, she goes in to buy this chunk of chocolate uh, and the shopkeeper is suspicious as I mentioned and he subjects her to a series of tests, he subjects her uh, to this offside drool of football. The assumption again being that all men know about football, but obviously this you know, the problematic assumptions begin to happen from this point. The fact that you assume, uh, suppose she, it was really uh, a man who walks into a store uh, and you know wants a Yorkie, but he doesn't know, he doesn't really care about football. So, the assumption is he would not get it. Right? So, the term that I want to give you at this point is metonymic marker. Right? So, what is metonymy? So, metonymy as you know those of you uh, most of you I am assuming come from uh, English studies background uh, with BA uh, um, in English. So, metonymy is a figure of speech which uses a particular part uh, to suggest a whole. I mean a very common uh, example would be suppose use the word spectre. Right? Uh, spectre would suggest royalty. Right? Uh, so, if I say uh, you know give us uh, 
if you tell, say the say the New Testament prayer in Bible, uh, so give us this day our daily bread. Now, what has been asked for is not really the literal bread, but you know, food. So bread becomes uh, you know metaphor as well as a metonymy for food. You know, it's sort of a little part which suggests a bigger whole. Okay, so you know, likewise. So all these tests that this girl has been subjected to become uh, metonymic markers for masculinity. So the helmet she is wearing, uh, which is a minus helmet, that becomes a marker for masculinity. The mustard she has on, that becomes a marker for masculinity. Uh, you know, the accent she has is a marker for masculinity. So all of that. And the other thing is obviously that uh, the knowledge of sports, knowledge of football, uh, which is uh, an absolute marker for masculinity. If you don't know football, if you don't know the offside rule in football, you're not really a man. But the problem is, uh, the, the interesting thing is, uh, and this is something I want to arrive at, and the reason why I'm spending some time with it, that if you notice, so embodiment, so if I'm to say that I oh, know I'm really a man, I, I'm really a woman, but I'm insufficiently masculine, I'm insufficiently feminine. So what I'm saying essentially is, it's not just about the biological manliness, it's not just about the physical, organic femininity or masculinity, etc. It's also, it also includes things like knowledge. It also includes things like expressions in language. It also includes things like, you know, little bits and pieces, little codes of social behavior, little codes of political behavior, little codes of emotional behavior. So it's a very intricate thing and all these things add up. All these things sort of come together and construct uh, an embodiment of masculinity or femininity. So embodiment is a very loaded term as you know. Embodiment entails, embodiment includes uh, knowledge, it includes expressions, it includes use of metaphors, it includes use of certain kind of language, it includes obviously dress, it includes uh, physical markers like mustache, etc. Now the girl in this particular advertisement, she wants to appropriate all those metonymic markers. So she passes all the tests. She puts on a minus helmet, which suggests she's a working class uh, lad uh, to a certain extent. Uh, she is speaking in a particular working class accent, which again uh, is her attempt to appear manly. She has a fake mustache, which is a physical marker for masculinity. And she's wearing this uh, very typically you know, check shirt worn by you know, casual lads, which who are more masculine than genteel lads. So all of that uh, she has completely covered. Right? So she passes the test, she passes the, uh, you know, the, the, the physical strength test, she passes uh, you know, the fear test, she passes the football knowledge test, she passes the vulgar knowledge uh, test and all of that. But the test that she does not pass in the end, which she fails in the end uh, spectacularly, is the flattery test. So when, when the shopkeeper asks her, so you know, tells her in a very whispered, uh, flirtatious kind of a way, that rapper brings out the beautiful blue of your eyes. That's what he says to her. Now, this she cannot resist. Uh, so she breaks down, uh, she gives in rather, she doesn't break down, she gives in, she reveals herself. She's exposed uh, that she is a woman uh, and obviously the Yorkie is snatched away from her. Now, the last line, the last, uh, the, the thing that appears on the screen, it says, it's not for girls, right? It's not for girls, it's a manly chunk of chocolate. So I'll just play it once more time now that I've explained it and you take a look and you find this is deeply interesting. So this is the Yorkie advertisement again on your screen. Yorkie, please, mate. You're not a bird, are you? No. Explain the offside rule, then. A player cannot be in an advanced position of the opponent's last defender when the ball is played. Open that. Stockings are tight. Stockings. Oh, look! A big hairy spider! You know, that wrapper really brings out the beautiful blue of your eyes. Really? Yorkie. <laughs> Party big masculine chunks of chocolate. It's not for girls. So, um, so now that you've seen it again, and obviously you can play it one more time and endlessly, and listen to what I've been saying, and it also fits in. So, you know, this is a really interesting advertisement. Uh, paradoxically, because of its offensive nature, because of its really regressive, offensive nature. So it's radical as well as offensive simultaneously, which is something you can't say uh, too often. Right? Now, it's something which breaks away from a certain paradigm. Uh, so you expect, okay, this is a deconstruction of the chocolate stereotype for women. That, you know, it's sort of saying that chocolates, uh, men love chocolates as well. But the point is, it pushes it to the other extreme. It says only men love this kind of chocolate. So this chocolate is something which can only be um, acquired by men. And it cannot be purchased. Now, this is an important bit. And this is what I'm coming at uh, now. What this particular chocolate does, it, it appears not just as a simple commodity. So a simple commodity is something you can walk in and buy. 
Uh, so any, anyone who has money, anyone who has access uh, to capital uh, can walk into a store and purchase it. But you know, interestingly, this particular advertisement is not about purchasing at all. It's about acquiring it. It's about deserving it. So that becomes more problematic. So you need to deserve a yaki. You cannot buy a yaki. It's like the things to say in martial arts. You, you, can't, you, know, you can't purchase a particular sword. You can't purchase a certain kind of belt. You have to acquire it through training, through you know, uh, different kinds of exercises. And you, know, you need to pass certain tests in order to go from one belt to another belt, etc. So again, it's very hierarchical. It's something which depends or requires performativity. It requires physical ability. And you can't just purchase it. Right? You need to acquire it. Okay? A similar kind of logic of acquisition, a similar kind of logic of possession uh, is sort of operative over here. So it's not about getting into a store and buying a Yorkie. I mean, it's not so simple as that. It's not, a, it's not a simple commodity. So in other words, this becomes something like a super commodity. So a super commodity is something which, you know, it, 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 sort of, it appears to transcend, it appears to go beyond just the simple monetary exchange. Right? It's not just about getting in and buying a particular thing. It's more than that. You need to come in with not just, not just a financial capital, but also a certain kind of a physical capital or embodiment capital. Right? That embodiment capital is important over here. So the girl over here, she's obviously coming into the store uh, with the money to buy a yaki, but she's aware that you know, she, she's sort of quote unquote um, inadequately or not appropriately embodied. Uh, in order to get this particular manly chunk of chocolate, interestingly, right? So again, manly chunk of chocolate is something of an oxymoron. You wouldn't normally expect it. But, so, but she's aware that she is inappropriately embodied uh, to acquire it. So what does she do? Uh, she puts on the markers of masculinity, the metonymic markers of masculinity in order to be fully embodied in order to get it, in order to acquire it, right? So, but obviously the process of acquiring the chocolate requires her or entails that she passes certain tests which she's subjected to. But the last test uh, is the most important test. Uh, so the, all the other tests she can sort of, the, the assumption over here is that she can train herself uh, to know about football. She can read up about football and know the uh, offside rule in football. She can train herself to be physically s strong. She can train herself to be uh, unaffected by spiders. Uh, she can train herself in the vulgar slangs you know, uh, used by men and all of that. But she cannot train herself to do away with flattery. So flattery, the assumption over here, flattery or responding to flattery or you know, being susceptible to flattery is so embedded uh, in the feminine self that no amount of training can get rid of it. And the, the reverse um, sexism is also true over here, right? Uh, and which is that men are completely unaffected by flattery. So if you praise a man for his good looks, if you praise a man for, a man for his handsomeness, you know, he would be completely unaffected by it because you know, men do not need to look beautiful. Men do not need to look handsome. And it doesn't, doesn't matter uh, if you're calling a man handsome or not. If you're, calling, if you're telling a man that you know, that rapper brings out the blue of your eyes, and no man would be affected by it. That's the assumption that this particular advertisement ends with. So all in all, you find this is a very interesting advertisement. This is something which uh, you know, you know, I find deeply interesting, especially if you're looking at the uh, entanglement between commodity formation, uh, commodification, commodity consumption, uh, and gender. Right? So and gendering of commodities, of course. And uh, by this time, I'm sure you know that uh, gendering is a term which you, know, you don't use it and you don't, it's not really limited to uh, organic uh, human uh, dimension. It sort of is go, it goes beyond the dimension. It, it goes to the inorganic dimension. It goes to the non-human dimension. It goes to uh, something as inanimate as you know, shoes, as inanimate as a chocolate, as inanimate as a cream. So all these things, there's nothing human about a cream, right? It's, it doesn't live. Uh, there's nothing human about a chocolate. It's not a walking animal. But uh, it's, it's deeply gendered. Why? Because the effect around it, uh, the desire around it, the entire design of desire around the particular commodity, that is a bit which is gendered. Right? So the way you're looking at it, the way you want to consume it, the entire politics of consumption around it. So these are the gendered things. Right? So, so they, hence they are humanized and anthropomorphized. Right? So the entire, uh, you know, the anthro dimension that comes in, the human dimension that comes in, the anthropomorphic dimension that comes in. So that's very important because that is related to the effect. 
right? So the, the, the entire affective apparatus, A F F E C T I V E, the entire affective apparatus in this uh, advertisements is what we're looking at uh, from a gender studies perspective. Okay, so this particular advertisement, and I, I, I insist that you, you know, I sort of, I suggest that you play it again and again and listen to this uh, and think about it more. Perhaps you can bring up, perhaps you can think of or unpack uh, even more complex things than what I've said so far. But the point is, I hope uh, that I've delivered to you by now that you know this is an advertisement which breaks away from a certain kind of uh, sexist stereotype, a certain kind of gender stereotype, but then it ends up being the reverse stereotypification, ends up being the reverse kind of a gendering whereby uh, you know, a, a chocolate becomes manly, but only manly. It's exclusively available to men, right? And not just men, and this is a, the complex bit. It's not just men. Uh, a man who walks into the store who doesn't know about football, a man who walks into a store who can't open that bottle of jar, you know, jam or whatever, a ma the man who walks into a store and is afraid of the spider, uh, you know, would probably fail the test as well, right? So it, it appeals to a certain kind of manliness. It appeals to a certain kind of masculinity, which is a sports-loving, vulgar, a physical, visceral, and it's very lumberjack kind of a masculinity, right? Very macho lumberjack masculinity, which is sort of deeply physical uh, and you know not really sensitive. That, that's a brand of masculinity which is being suggested, which is being portrayed and dramatized spectacularly in this particular advertisement, right? So this is a Yorkie ad for you, and, and I'll just play a couple of more ads just to sort of tie it together. So the next ad I'm going to play uh, is uh, an advertisement by, it's, it's a Pepsi advertisement, Pepsi Max. Uh, and again, uh, what it shows is deeply gendered. What it shows is, you know, it's only women who cry and men never cry, right? And no matter how much pain you experience, no matter, no matter how hurt you are uh, you know, at a physical level, uh, you don't cry because it's unmanly to cry. Right? And of course, it's a very stupid assumption. It's a completely unscientific and non-empirical. There's no empirical evidence behind it at all. But it's a, it's a complete social structure. It's a complete social design which uh, makes this moral system. So this entire morality of crying and non-crying, uh, men not crying, a woman crying, is obviously a manufactured morality, like all forms of morality. But this is sort of more ostensibly uh, uh, manufactured because it, it is a, a very much on a surface level. And uh, of course, this is the kind of morality, this is the kind of value system which would be picked up by uh, certain kinds of commodities, certain kinds of products and brands which want to sell themselves, promote themselves, or uh, portray or project themselves uh, in terms of certain gendered uh, identification, right? So this particular advertisement by Pepsi Max, again, and I'm playing this uh, in relation to the Yorkie advertisement because this too, uh, it, it sort of constructs and portrays and delivers a certain kind of masculinity. Uh, so it sort of says that um, you know if you're a real man, you never cry, uh, you know, no matter how much uh, pain you go through. But the good thing about this particular ad is uh, it's it sort of parodies that masculinity. It mocks at that masculinity. It's not really reverential towards that masculinity. Uh, it mocks at it, and it's very clear to us that the whole thing is meant to be uh, received as a parody. So this is the advertisement by Pepsi Max. Uh, it says men don't cry. This is coming up on your screen now. Basically, it's about I'm good. Be honest here, I mean. Ah, fuck it. I'm good. My bad. I'm good. I'm the man! I'm good. Ready? No. Men can take anything. I'm good. Except the taste of Diet Cola. Until now. Pepsi Max, the first Diet Cola for men. This is good. Okay, so this is again um, a deeply sexist thing, uh, you know, it's sort of funny, it's mocking a certain kind of masculinity, etc. But did you hear the last bit of the advertisement? It says men can take anything, you know, any amount of physical pain, any amount of inconvenience, any amount of hurt that uh, can be tolerated, can be dealt with by men, except the taste of, the taste of diet cola. So again, the assumption is diet cola is sort of a feminine thing. Diet cola is an unmanly thing, right? So now it's a bit like the fair and handsome thing which we saw yesterday. Uh, so when the actor Shah Rukh Khan comes and tells the wrestler, if you want to be fair, do it in a manly way, right? So don't don't consume the female fairness cream because it'll, it'll take you to a different direction and you'll be lampooned, you'll be mocked at, you'll be parodied, which you saw in the advertisement when the wrestler wears a frock and. Uh, it's made to dance in a very grotesque way, uh, you know, and obviously it's not really feminine. It's a very grotesque parody of that masculinity. 
which is being portrayed. Now, sim a similar thing happens here as well. So it says that men can't take anything. Uh, and obviously, that, then it shows a series of stupid men, uh, macho idiots, uh, who, you know, they say, I'm good every time, you know, they get hurt. So they never cry, they never break down. Uh, it's, they, they receive blows very, very manly, uh, you know. So it's a very manly reception of blows, which is being sort of told to you and shown to you on the screen. But that's meant to be stupid, that's meant to be ridiculous. But the point is, at the end of the advertisement, uh, the voiceover says that men can take everything uh, except the taste of diet cola. So diet cola is unmanly, diet cola is you know, something which is you know, consumed by women, diet cola is not real cola, etc, etc, etc. And then the voiceover continues and says, except until this point. So this is the equation, this is the analogy uh, that one can make with the fairness cream. It says, okay, uh, men never use fairness cream until this point because now we have a cream which says fair and handsome. It, you know, it doesn't have to be fair and lovely anymore. So you can be fair and handsome together. Of course, handsome is a lovely, manly thing to be. Likewise, over here, it says, you know, men can take anything, so the taste of diet cola, which is terrible, which is supposed to be unmanly. But now we have a new kind of diet cola, Pepsi Max which will still give you the manly fizz, but at the same time, it will, it will keep you sort of safe at a calorific level. Uh, in terms of the calorie consumption, you're still you're okay because you're not consuming lots of calories, but, uh, you know, you're still being manly, right? So, you know, it gives you the best of both in certain sense. So, you know, you, you consume the diet cola, uh, but at the same time, you have this manly uh, experience because, you know, you don't have the, you know, non-fizzy uh, other diet cokes. Right? So Pepsi Max over here, it brands itself as a manly diet drink. And again, so dieting, and this is the, the, the point that I was trying to arrive at over here. Dieting is not supposed to be quote unquote a manly thing. Dieting is done by women, dieting is done by lesser men. That's the assumption over here. So again, look at the very sexist binary uh, that is operative, that is rampant. I mean, we're not talking about, we're not digging up some obscure uh, letter from somewhere. We're not digging up some obscure propaganda from somewhere. This is very much a part of mainstream consumerist culture. We're talking about Pepsi. We're talking about Yorkie chocolate. We're talking about, uh, you know, Axe deodorant. We're talking about uh, a brand of a particular, you know, you know a garment brand, H&M. So you know, all these are very, very available, visible, accessible brands. But notice the way, and we don't have to look for look afar, you don't have to look really at obscure regions. Notice the way in which mainstream media, mainstream media of consumption, which is consumed in television and in all kinds of forms, that too uh, you know, is so embedded with sexism. That too is so embedded with gendered binaries. Right? So the entire assumption over here is that you know, it's only women who love diet cola. Uh, women don't like the real cola. And uh, so it takes you back to the Heineken and shoes advertisement. right? Because Heineken is a beer and the assumption is men, only men love beer and women love fancy shoes. You, know, you can't mix up the two. The same kind of politics of consumption is operative here when it says, when it's supposed to say, it seems to say that, you know, this is something which only men enjoy, right? So men, real men don't like diet cola. Real men hate diet cola. Real men can take anything. They can take any kind of blow, no matter how physically painful that is. They'll just say, I'm good. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mockery of a macho stupidity. But, you know, they can take anything but, uh, you know, the smell of Diet Coke. But now we have a new kind of Diet Cola, which is Pepsi Max. So Pepsi Max is a manly Diet Cola, just like Fair and Handsome is a manly fairness cream. So you, you get the point. So it's kind of a de-branding as well as a rebranding. So it's branding away from a certain kind of a consumerist culture. So it's saying that, oh, this is a, you know, ungendering of that kind of a brand. So this is no longer uh, a feminine thing. We are giving you a manly diet coke. There's a manly way to do dieting. There's a manly way to look after your calories. Uh, you know, you can still be this macho idiot. You can still be this manly guy who very gruffly will say, I'm good and drink diet cola. It will still be okay. Just like you can still be a, a, a very manly wrestler and uh, you know, wear a fair and handsome cream and it'll still be okay, right? So this is the point, this is the entire assumption uh, around this particular advertisement. So I played one more time uh, and you just take a look after I have said this to you, uh, just take a look again and you know what I'm saying. Right, so this is a Pepsi Max commercial on your screen. Basically, it's about symmetry. I'm good. Be honest here, I mean. Ah, fuck it. I'm good. My bad. I'm good. I'm the man! I'm good. Ready? No! Ah! Oh! Oh! 
down. Men can take anything. I'm good. Except the taste of Diet Cola. Until now, Pepsi Max, the first Diet Cola for men. This is good. Right, so as you can see, I mean, these are very stupid men. So we talk about um, really stupid forms of masculinity. So we, we, it's really addressing the sort of lowest common denominator of masculinity. Uh, that's very evident over here. But it's saying that, you know, it can all come in. So even those men who, can't, who don't care about calories, these are men who are so stupid, they probably don't know what calories is. They couldn't care less about healthy food. They couldn't care less about, you know, healthy diet, etc. It's sort of bringing those men into the fold. It's saying, then you can come in, you can still be stupid and manly and have this diet thing and it'll still be okay. Right? So we put in something in this diet cola which will still make you experience manliness uh, you know, at your level of masculinity. Uh, but at the same time, this will also look after your calories. So you know, the entire package over here, as you can see, is a very complex package. And also, the, the important thing is women are absolutely excluded from this. So both the ads which you saw now, the Yorkie ad and this one over here, it, it, the, both of those are premised on an exclusion of the female presence. There's no female at all in the whole advertisement. So females are not allowed, uh, in a certain sense, to consume these products. So this is what I mean, mean when I say that these are, not, these are not trying to brand themselves as simple commodities. Th these are complex super commodities. Which sort of, they, they seem to say that if you want to acquire this, you have to deserve this. You have to you know, em embody yourself in a, in a certain kind of a way. Right? You know, to come up with a certain kind of embodiment. You can't just walk in and purchase this. I mean, the Yorkie ad was very clear about it. It sort of says that, you know, you can't walk in the store, uh, give some money to the till, uh, person the till, and say, Yorkie made, and you'll get the Yorkie. You'll not, you'll not get it that way. You have to pass the test. You have to pass the metonymic markers of masculinity. Right? And you have to sort of come up with the right form of embodiment, with the right diagram of embodiment, uh, with the right knowledge of embodiment. So, you know, you, you have to be perfectly embodied in order to get that particular product. So, likewise, the Pepsi Max advertisement which you saw over here, that too uh, is a very good example of a certain kind of masculinity, a certain kind of gender behavior uh, which uh, corresponds to a particular commodity. Okay? So, uh, you know, so both these ads, uh, as you can see, and I'm trying to, so I'm winding up now, both these ads uh, very clearly suggest to you, that, and of course, as I just mentioned a little while ago, that these are ads which are very much uh, a part of mainstream media culture. We're not talking about some obscure ad in some corner of the world, but this is very much mainstream media, uh, you know, globally televised, uh, everyone can watch it, uh, everyone can access it. So, you know, it's, it's part of the liberal world, uh, it's part of the Western liberal world uh, from which it emanates. So, you know, it's very much a part of uh, the dominant rhetoric, the dominant discourse of gender behavior, of gender forms of consumption, right? Uh, but, you know, the offensive thing about this ad, obviously, I mean, at a surface level, uh, it is the exclusion of women, uh, the discrimination uh, against you know, the, the female gender, that the women are not allowed to have your key unless they really pass it all the tests. Uh, you know, men are the only ones who enjoy and the real cola, uh, and all women enjoy diet cola. But you know, now we have a different kind of diet cola, which is men for men, uh, especially men who don't cry, men who say, uh, I'm good every time they're hurt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, it is completely premised on exclusion. It appeals to a certain kind of an audience, it appeals to a certain kind of a consumer, a certain culture of a consumer, but at the same time, uh, it draws itself away, it moves away uh, quite clearly uh, from certain other kinds of consumers. So in a, even if we're looking inside masculinity, a person with no knowledge of football, a person with not a great amount of physical strength, a person who is sensitive to vulgar jokes, a person who is afraid of spiders, would probably also fail the Yorkie test, right? Uh, would probably also be denied uh, the Yorkie. Just like the, the woman who wanted to have the Yorkie, the woman who aspired for that embodiment uh, failed eventually as well. So even within masculinity, it is appealing to a certain kind of masculinity. Likewise, the Pepsi commercial over here, it appeals to a certain kind of masculinity. It's, it appeals to a certain kind of male behavior, uh, which includes stupidity, uh, you know, insensitivity, uh, you know, denial of pain, a denial of being hurt, etc., etc. So these are the men who are appealed, these are the men who are addressed, these are the men who are brought into the, the, the fold. Uh, and you know, they are sort of told essentially to this advertisement that we have a cola uh, for you, which is diet, so it's okay at a calorific level, but at the same time, it's extremely manly. You can still be manly uh, and uh, 
consume this diet cola. Right? So this is the entire uh, gamut, this is the entire uh, politics of consumption around these three particular advertisements. Right? So all the advertisements which you played so far, uh, you know, the, the, the Yorkie commercial, the, um, um, you know, if you remember the Axe commercial yesterday where we have you know, different kinds of embodiments uh, at play with each other, the wealthy white desirable form of embodiment. Uh, which is interrupted in the end by someone who uses the commodity. So, you know, using the commodity will make you super embodied uh, at a metaphorical level, uh, which is what happens in the um, Axe advertisement. But, you know, it all requires different forms of embodiment. It all requires different forms of performativity. So, again, all these terms which have been, you know, uh, and I've, been, I've been talking about these terms, I've been throwing at these terms to you uh, since the inception of this course, embodiment, performativity, identity, agency. So, all these mimicry, all these terms which you have been discussing extensively uh, from the beginning of the school. So, they all come together as you can see uh, and they are very important crucial terms uh, especially when it comes to advertisements because advertisement is all about embodiment. Uh, uh, advertisements is uh, almost, almost entirely about performativity. Right? It is how you perform, how you achieve a certain spectacle, how you acquire a certain design of desire right? through uh, strategic excess, through strategic um, you know, forms of excessiveness. Uh, you know, larger than life, uh, stylized, excessive, uh, affective, um, you know, you are trying to achieve an effect uh, of all reference, uh, you know, larger than lifeness, etc. Uh, you know, and how do you bring all these things together in order to uh, sort of portray or um, depict a commodity uh, which is uh, in every sense of the term hyper real. So, you know, if you look at the if you replay the David Beckham advertisement yesterday, uh, the H and M advertisement yesterday, and uh, you know, he walks into this uh, all male space where only men play uh, in a billiard or snooker, uh, you know, around the table. There's no female around the table, um, you know, and the, the two men compete with each other. So that's an example of internal hegemony. So who's going to be the dominant gendered identity in that room? And obviously uh, Beckham wins it uh, in that particular advertisement because it's wearing the superior brand. Uh, he already has better form of embodiment. He already has a better order of embodiment, right? And that makes him the winner in the end. But interestingly, if you remember the avatar, if you just go back to the previous lecture and play it again, you will find that, you know, the reason why he wins it is because he does something super performative, right? So, he manages to hit a particular billet ball in a, in, in a manner which is logically unthinkable, which is logically almost impossible, but he achieves it. And in, in the process of achieving it, he acquires a, a super embodied status. Right? So, the super embodied status he has in the end is based on the performativity that he displays with that particular billiard shot. Right? So, just to conclude this lecture, so all these terms which you have been talking about performativity, identity, agency, uh, you know, effect, uh, embodiment. So, all these terms are very crucial terms especially when you look at advertisements because advertisements uh, you know they entail a combination, a very asymmetric combination of all these different forms of apparatus and they want to brand a particular commodity, sell it and make it hyper real, make it performative for the consumption of the people. And obviously, as I mentioned in the last couple of lectures and repeat and conclude with this, the location of the consumer is absolutely important. It's very important because you, you're appealing to a certain race, you're appealing to a certain class of people, you're appealing to a certain value system, you're appealing to a certain kind of a demography. And if you're insensitive to the demography, then obviously as a commodity, the entire uh, the politics of commodification will fail. Right? So, all these things are very important and it's absolutely imperative for us who are interested in gender and advertisements uh, to, to be aware of the process of you know, the, the context around the commodity in order to study how the commodification happens. So, this is, uh, so I'll conclude the lecture today and in the coming two lectures, in the last two lectures of this course, we'll move on and look at one more advertisement, uh, maybe a few more advertisements and one particular scene from a very famous film and look at how space and gendered identity uh, correlate with each other at very, very complex combinations. So, thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.